Hey, Zane Griggs here. Uh, today I want to talk to you about whole grains, all those healthy grains that we've been told to eat for the last, who knows how, 50 plus years, how wonderful they are for us, all that wonderful fiber prevents, uh, you know, obesity, it's good for your heart, uh, good, good for everything, right? Mm, let's think again, okay? Uh, let's, let's first, a little, a little history lesson for you, uh, recent history. In the last, oh, say 60, 70 years, sometime around the 1940s and 50s, our wheat, okay, changed. Uh, the wheat we had, say, the wheat your great grandparents ate, okay, in the, in the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, 1900s, is more like the wheat they were eating in Europe and, middle, and the Middle East, okay, 2,000 to 5,000 years ago, than it is like the wheat we eat today in the United States. Because through crossbreeding, okay, in an effort to Feed more people, okay, so good intentions, uh, but bad judgment. So through crossbreeding, they've added, they took the gluten protein, um, it's a protein in wheat, which was about five, made up about 5% of the proteins in wheat, and they magnified it to make things fluffier and starchier, okay, uh, and more hearty, okay, and makes it that kind of doughiness that we uh, are used to in our bread. Um, but they took that up to about, you know, maybe 25, 30% of the proteins. Now, it sounds like much maybe to some of you, but that's an increase of five to six times of a particular protein in wheat just through crossbreeding. Now, the, the wheat from a long time ago, you know, the waves of grain, amber waves of grain that we hear about in our, in our national anthem, we don't have those anymore. The, the grain's not that tall anymore. Wheat doesn't come up four feet anymore. It doesn't come up four or four and a half feet. It's a, it's a, it's a shorter grain. It's called short, it's a dwarf wheat is what it's called. And it's maybe two and a half feet, so it makes it hardier. It withstands weather better and bugs um, and all sorts of other things. But it's, it's got more starch in it and less uh, of a fiber, really. Um, but it's that gluten. Now, the one thing they didn't take into in the mind, uh, and they didn't think about how, the, how this would affect us as a, as a species. Okay, and how our bodies would respond to gluten. They didn't test us for that. They didn't think it'd be a problem. They'd go, oh, it's more of it, right? More food. Uh, the problem is we've seen an increase in the effects of gluten. And it's not just about the gut. It's not about celiac disease. That's just one gene expression that comes out from the effects of gluten. There are a host of other symptoms that are probably going undiagnosed or they're not being related to the effects of gluten. And some of those would be um, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's or dementia, okay, uh, ADHD, uh, epileptic seizures, uh, increased schizophrenic uh, episodes, seriously. Um, so a lot of things related to the brain. Now I'm getting this from, now I'm not making this stuff up, <laughs> again. Uh, this great book called Grain Brain by Dr. David Perlmutter. Uh, and he actually says, the surprising truth about wheat, carbs, and sugar, your brain's silent killers, because you don't see this happening. You may not recognize this happening, uh, or realize it's not being diagnosed as a source, as maybe a food source, or as being from gluten. But it's a great book, uh, very insightful about, you know, it gives some, gives some diet tips as well, uh, takes the fear away from cholesterol, which is actually pretty good for your brain, really good for your brain, and your hormones, as opposed to gluten, because the symptoms from gluten, I mean, we're talking about lower libido. I mean, nobody wants that. Uh, insomnia, another you know, not fun thing. Um, headaches, migraines. Think about that. Break it down. Gluten, migraine, my grain. It's a grain. Migraine. I'm telling you, uh, it's the gluten. No, no, I'm not saying it's responsible for all migraines. It's allergies. It's the inflammation. The problem is it creates inflammation. And depending on how it expresses itself in each of us, okay, it's going to be a little bit different. So some of us have a different gene expression for uh, how the gluten uh, affects us or the inflammation affects us. could be just heart disease, creating that inflammation uh, and a buildup of plaques from that inflammation, right? Just like sugar. So uh, you may not be aware of it, but it is in everything. It's a filler in so many foods. We're eating so much more of it now, and there's so much more gluten in the wheat that we've seen this great epidemic or change in these types of diseases or symptoms, modern, okay, much more modern. Uh, we, there wasn't a celiac problem, okay, for instance, you know, 150 years ago. There's not like we have now. And the migraines and the dementia, epileptic. Actually, they did this experiment, which they did this back before there was a whole lot of guidelines. This is very, I found this very interesting. Um, so a good 
uh, I think this was the 60s or 70s, but they were they did this experiment in these essentially um, mental hospitals or mental you know places where they kept schizophrenics. Okay, and they someone suspected that gluten or their diet may have had an effect on the frequency of schizophrenic episodes and uh, hallucinations. Okay, so they hallucinate. Um, they kind of freak out, and there was an increased rate of suicide within those hospitals as well with these schizophrenics. So when they removed gluten, uh, the frequency of the hallucinations, the episodes, and the, and the um, suicides actually went down. Bring the gluten back into the diet, they came back up to what it had been before. Then they introduced, because see, gluten actually um, affects our opiate receptors. So the same receptors that receive heroin, cocaine, opium, okay, also uh, are reactionary to gluten. And gluten seems to be attracted to it. Basically, they, 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 they play, okay, and they mess with us a little bit. So the opiate receptors are reactive to gluten. So they gave these um, people, these schizophrenics, uh, a, a sort of a, a uh, opiate blocker that they give to uh, drug addicts to help them get off of the drugs because they know they can't always keep the, the, the drugs from the, the drug addicts, but they give them uh, a drug which blocks that opiate receptor. So even if they take in an opiate, uh, they, don't, they don't get a high. They don't get the, the reaction from it in the brain. Well, they gave this same opiate blocker to the schizophrenic in this hospital. Yes, not very... Not very, uh, what we consider ethical these days. This was long before there was a lot of oversight. But the, the, the fact is, when they gave them this, this opiate blocker and then it reintroduced gluten, they did not have the schizophrenic episodes, the hallucinations, and the, the level of suicides that were there before, uh, when, the, when the gluten was there before the, the drug. So, um, there was an obvious association there between the, uh, the the schizophrenic episodes, hallucinations, and suicides, and the prevalence of gluten in the diet. And that's, you know, you're talking about some, someone with already a compromised brain, okay, already a diseased or compromised brain, has this reaction. Um, now, we don't all, not going to have that reaction because we're not all compromised in that way, but we all have a different way of, of expressing inflammation in our genes. And again, because it's our brain, we may not really be aware of it. It's kind of like you don't know plaques building up in your heart. You know plaques are building up in your brains to create dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, and you may not realize that those migraines or the reduced libido or the insomnia uh, or the, maybe the epileptic seizures could be caused by something that's dietary that may affect one person, doesn't, affect, doesn't have that effect on one person, but might be affecting uh, another person in this particular way. Again, it, it causes an infl inflammatory response and that's how it expresses itself in that person. So it's not going to be saying for all of us. We're all, we're all just a little different, but we all respond in an you know, to gluten with some form of inflammation just because our bodies um, aren't used to, to dealing with it in, in, to the degree that we are uh, receiving it because of the crossbreeding, because of the increased gluten okay, of five to six times what it was in our human history, going back ten or more thousand years since they started growing wheat. So, if you have any questions, I know this is kind of something you've probably heard before. Again, check out the book, Grain Brain. He's actually got a, a follow-up book with a, a way to heal your brain. Um, I'll bring that down another time. It's got some good stuff with dietary changes. Uh, but it's very insightful, not just about gluten, but, how, but other ways to, things to bring in, like I said, cholesterol, uh, healthy fats, high fat, low carb. See the theme? Low carb, high fat. Crossing through. Um, so, Brain Brain, check it out, David, doc, Dr. David Perlmutter. Uh, we're going to any questions, and if you know somebody, or, you know, comment below, but if you know somebody that could benefit from this, please tag them in the comments so they can uh, see it as well. Talk to you later.